Psalm 47. The scriptures say, Oh, clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with the voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob, whom he loves. God has ascended with a shout. The Lord, with the sound of a trumpet, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises for God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful song. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let's pray. Lord God, you are highly exalted. You are the king of the whole earth. You are the one that we're here to sing praises to tonight. To lift our shouts, to clap our hands and to focus in on worshiping you. I pray this evening as, as we do just that. As we, as we pray, as we sing, as we study your word. Lord, show us a greater taste of your kingliness. Of your majesty. Of your might. Of your power. Of your worthiness. Help us not to be able to miss that today. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Woo! We are alive. All right. Let's all stand if we could. Why don't you turn around and say hi to somebody real quick? We're going to sing this great hymn of our faith. Crown him with many crowns. I hope you join your voices as we worship Jesus Christ together. All right. Let's sing it. With many crowns, the Lamb upon His throne, how the heavenly anthem drowns the music, but it's home. Away.
Jesus is the Lord and magnified all of our days. Let's praise the name of our Lord continually. Amen and amen. You may be seated, church. Well, good evening. Howdy. I like that. Good to see all y'all tonight. Welcome to night three of our revival this year. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Brian. I'm pastor here at Heightsville Baptist Church, and we are glad to have you with us this evening, worshiping our King. And so, special hi and hello as well to those joining us on Facebook. Good to have y'all with us as well. No matter where you are, we'd love to connect with you and help you uh, join in with us as we walk with our Jesus day by day. And so, if you're here on campus, I'd love to talk to you tonight. I'll be at the back door at the end of worship service. I'd love to talk to you there. If you're not here with us tonight, that's okay. Go to HeightsvilleBaptistChurch.com. Go to the Connect tab, fill out the form, and it'll send an email right over to us, and we'll be able to get in touch with you through there. We also want to remind all of our families that are here tonight that we do have a children's bulletin. It's a different one than we had yesterday. Uh, we're going to be matching up uh, the children's bulletin tonight with Mike's sermon that he'll be preaching here in just a few minutes. So, you know, David, we've got a new bulletin out there for you. If you, if you need your color and pages, it's a new one. Uh, we we want to make sure you're, we're fresh on what mazes we're going through on the bulletins tonight. So uh, we're looking forward to another great night of worship today. Uh, I think it's going to be a good one. And uh, Nuno's going to help us get with that right now. Amen. Hey, everybody. Everybody doing okay? Then I'm having a ring. Uh, I don't know where the ring is coming from, but... All right. Can you all hear the ring? Yeah. I have no idea. All right. It's all right. We'll figure it out. Anyway, it is so good to see you all here again. Thank you so much for coming out. That's getting better. Good job, Dan. Yes, you're the man. Dan the man. That's a good nickname for you all there. Anyway, I um, already said it's so good to see you all. I'm glad that you're here again tonight. Let me see. Getting, my wife is not here tonight because we had soccer. And it's the last soccer uh, uh, practice of the year for my son, Luca. And he's like the star of the team. And I'm not ashamed of saying that because he is really good. Anyway, I'm proud of him. Uh, actually, I'm the coach too, so... But I'm skipping for y'all, actually for the Lord, but I'm here with y'all. Anyway, uh, it is an honor. Thank you so much for the invitation. Y'all have been so kind to, you know, my wife uh, and my family, and I'm sure Pastor Mike says the same thing. But, you know, from the feeding that y'all have been giving us, from just a warm, warm welcome, um, it's been just a, a delight to be here with y'all these last few days and just worshiping Jesus together with you. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a great opportunity we have to just gather more than two days a week to, to lift up the name of the Lord together. So it has been our prayer that uh, because revival starts within us, right? So uh, it has been our prayer that uh, as, we, as you come uh, to these meetings, um, not because that's because my mama would tell me to do, that go to church. I'm hoping that you come here with an expectation that the Lord is going to speak to you in a mighty way. That's how revival starts. It's you in your word, in the word of God every day, but also coming to, with an expectation. If, you on, if you're only coming to just kind of warm up the pews, you know, just don't even come. It might be a waste of time for you. But if you come with an expectation that God's going to speak to you mightily, that's a different ballgame, y'all. God will. God will. He wants to. He wants to excite you for him. And, um, and I pray that, uh, that uh, the songs that we'll be singing, the words that Pastor Mike James and the words of the scriptures uh, encourage you and get you on fire for the Lord. Um, I'm going to also read from, from the Psalms. Um, and it's Psalm 148. It says, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all your shining stars. Praise Him, highest heavens and you waters above the earth. Praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded and they were created. Let them, let all of us, all His created things, praise the name of the Lord. For His name alone is exalted. So That's what we're going to hear tonight. Uh, we're going to do here tonight, church. Uh, we're going to sing another great hymn of our faith, so if you could, uh, let's sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King 
of creation. Let's all stand. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise you for he is thy wealth and salvation. Oh, more you hear, now to his temple draw The Lord above all things, so wondrous He made me. Shelter you under His wings, yet so gently sustain me. Can you not see all that is beautiful as Consider what He Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, oh let all that is in me adore you. All that had life and breath comes now, praises before you. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Gladly forever. church. Let's sing this last verse one more time. Praise to the Lord, oh let all that is in me. Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Wonder his wonders and mercy here daily attend thee. Anew what the Almighty he can do if with his love he befriends thee. Amen. Sing this new great hymn of our faith, Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness, door through the shadows of my soul. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my
Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Let's sing that again, church. Then came the morning, they sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The Jesus, yours is the victory. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every stain. Your salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, that has lost his grief on me, he broke every chain, your salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. going to sing Psalm 150 one more time uh, tonight, but instead I decided to, um, you know, not sing it uh, with you all, but I decided to share a little bit of my story uh, with you all tonight. Uh, none of y'all previously, except for Pastor Mike and my son, here knew me from, uh, from nowhere really, um, but um, I have, a, I have a story of, of redemption uh, that, of course, like all of us here, we were in darkness, and then after we found Jesus, you know, everything turned around, right? Uh, we live for his glory. We live with a future hope, just like we just sang, uh, proclaiming that Jesus, you are our living hope. Uh, but I wanted to share a little bit of, of the story of how I, how I became a Kentuckian, <laughs> you know? Well, I, um, I shared with some of you all that I grew up in Brazil. Um, all my life, we, we, I lived in a house uh, with uh, my two sisters and, and both of my parents um, in Fortaleza, Brazil, which is in the northeast um, of Brazil, right on the coast. I grew up surfing. I grew up playing soccer. Um, but I also grew up going to church. My grandfather um, was the pastor uh, of First Baptist Church in my hometown uh, for, for many, many years. And um, so I grew up hearing the gospel, um, you know, of course, every, every time I was in a, a church, but also um, at home. You know, my, my father was really involved in the church ministry, you know, music, but also with the young adults and the young married couple. Him and my mom used to lead the group uh, in my home church. But, um, 
Um, my dream, as far as I can remember, was always to come to the United States. You know, you grew up watching, uh, you know, movies, and you see uh, all the awesome things that this country had to offer, you know. Um, but in my mind, it was all those things were the monetary things, uh, you know, was the awesome freedom. Y'all didn't have any walls around your house. You know, you can see everybody's house. In Brazil, we have 10 feet walls with barbed wires everywhere and electric fences and everything around to keep everybody away from your house. Anyway, I grew up watching all of that, you know, like dreaming, like, you know, what's, what's like? What is it like to be, you know, feel like that freedom? Well, 1995 came, 1994, everything started in 1994. I was 14 years old, you can make the math, I'm 41. Uh, uh, 1994, um, if you remember, America hosted uh, the World Cup, right? 1994, and, um, and, uh, and by the way, Brazil won the World Cup in 1994. <laughs> Just saying, anyway. Um, 1994, my, in 1994, um, my aunt uh, moved to the United States with her son um, after, uh, unfortunately, a, a just a, a not good um, home upbringing for my, my little cousin at the time because of his father. Uh, they decided to try a new life in the United States, in Orlando, Florida. Um, and, um, you know, praise the Lord, uh, she did great right from the beginning, uh, finding people around her, finding a church home around her to love on her. Um, so 1995 came, and you know, uh, if you know anything about Latino culture, fifth, when you when a person, especially girls but boys too, uh, when they turn 15 is a big deal. When you turn 15 is a big deal. So I got a trip to come visit my aunt in 1995 to come to the United States for the first time ever. My mom. And my dad surprised me at breakfast with a ticket uh, to, to come to Orlando uh, after I turned 15. So I came, I spent a month um, in Orlando with my aunt, and uh, um, I told my father that I did not want to go back. I don't want to go back, I want to stay here with my aunt. I, I can go to high school, it's free. It's free to go to high school here, can you believe that? And it's good. Because in Brazil, to get a good education, you gotta pay, and you gotta pay a bunch of money to, to get good at education. Anyway, so I wanna come here, I wanna finish high school here, and I'm gonna learn English. Now, nobody in Brazil speaks English. I'm gonna speak, you know, I'm gonna be bilingual. Uh, my father said, no, you ain't going nowhere, except he said that in Portuguese. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. You're gonna come back home, and uh, your, your place is to be beside your mother and I, and we're gonna raise you, not anybody else. So, and I said, is it like that? Like, yes it is. Like, okay. So I said, okay, I'm gonna put a, ear, a re earring on. And he said, no you're not. He's like, yes I will. He's like, you better not. Well, you, he, you're not here. So, I'm 15 years old, I know better. <laughs> well, here we go folks, I go to the shopping center, I lied to my aunt, said that my father allowed me to put an ear, ear, ear wrong. I put an ear ring on on my left ear. So here I go back home, you know, everything is good. A month later, my father sees me coming down uh, the, the escalators from, you know, now airport. The first words that came out of his mouth, I'm disappointed in you. For over two months, my father did not speak to me because of my disobedience. Uh, to him, and uh, I realized for the first time that, that that man right there has given everything for me, and for those two months, I tried my best to undo what I already had done. Praise the Lord, you know, we're in good terms, of course, after a bunch of time. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so that was my first lesson about obedience. With that lesson came an even larger lesson because when I was in the t my teenager years, I was very rebellious because I was in a surfer crowd. Um, and praise the Lord, the Lord has spared me for, from, drug, from drugs and alcohol, but he did not spare me from bad company. Um, 
And when I was about 16 years old, so just a year after all that incident with my father, uh, my grandfather, the pastor, wrote me a letter. Because by that time I was already involved, uh, you know, at church, uh, learning, you know, leading music and everything. And my father said that he was sure that God had something special in my life. That he and my grandmother had been praying for a long, long time. For not only myself, for all my family, but specifically for me. Because he knew he had something special um, in my life. He had no idea what it was. Maybe it was related to music. Maybe it was missions. We don't know. So he wrote me that letter, and that's when it clicked. That my reconciliation with my earthly father, I needed to actually reconcile with my heavenly father then. So at that moment, I started praying about, about God, what do you have for me? What, like, you, you allow me to... to to play the guitar, to lead music at church, and now this letter is right in front of me, and now knowing that my grandfather is praying for me, I have a great relationship with my father. Um, what's up? What's going on? So in the next several years, uh, God started shaping me and molding me with the right leaders, with the right mentors, uh, with the right uh, church environment to mold me, to, to start realizing uh, of the calling that he had in my life. So I'm going to start speeding up here. Um, so 1999, 1999, my parents get an invitation to come to the United States to manage a company that hired Brazilians to do construction. So the company was growing. They need somebody that they could trust to partner with them. So my mom came uh, to visit to see if that would work out. We came back. She said, we're going to America. But you have the choice to stay or go. I was set to go to seminary. I was ready to go. Um, and I said, did you just say that you're going to the United States? God is in the United States too. So here I go. I'm going to, so I just, uh, you know, uh, I decided to go with my family um, to Orlando, Florida. Uh, so in 2000, uh, of, uh, 2000, February of 2000, uh, everybody, all, of, all five of us moved. So I was working with my family. Uh, everything was working out, working out great, and my father said, "No, no, why don't you go back home, close all bank accounts, uh, sell the car, do all the adult stuff, um, since you know the Lord has been blessing us here." Uh, and I said, "Sure." So I went to, I went back to my hometown, went to my high school to visit um, friends. When I got there, do you know? Uh, have you heard of Campbellsville University? Right? Of course you had. Um, Campbellsville University in the late 90s, early 2000s had a huge partnership with all Baptist high schools in Brazil. My high school was one of them. So when I got there, this is how the Lord really orchestrated everything. When I got there, the vice president of the university was there. The international liaison was there. And the translator for them was the piano player for my home church. She saw me growing up. She knew of our situation. She knew everything about my life, you know, because we were really good friends. Um, so she asked, Nuna, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just working with my dad. Oh, really? Okay, just a second. She talked a bunch of English there. I had no idea what she said. To make story short, short, two weeks later, I was coming to Campbellsville University. So the Lord had the right people at the right time um, to one more time speak into my life. I'm really going to speed up now. Um, got to Campbellsville in August of 2000, so four months only in Orlando, moved to, um, to Campbellsville. So my hometown, two and a half million people, Orlando, about 500,000, Campbellsville, 20,000. <laughs> Can you see the, the culture change, right? So I got there not knowing anybody, not having any English um, uh, at Campbellsville. That's, that's in August of 2000. Um, and the Lord just inundated me with people that spoke into my life right away. The Brazilian community in, at Campbellsville was, was pretty large. We had about 80 Brazilians uh, at that time it, for a school of 1,500. It's a, it's a big group. Uh, so um, and there was a pastor there, a friend of mine, um, 
they just loved on me. I mean, I cried for the first two weeks like, like a baby. My mom said, do not come back. Do not come back. That's just, it's one of the reasons that we moved to the United States is to give you a better life. So, fought through it. I apply, I'm telling you, I applied for 15 uh, schools in Florida trying to transfer. Nobody, nobody <laughs> gave me enough money to go back. Everybody said, yeah, you approved, but I, I cannot give you any money. And at the time, Campbell, I was playing soccer for Campbellsville. I tried out for everything. From the cafeteria to playing soccer to playing music in every uh, ensemble available. I was, are you paying me something? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it for you. Are you serving me free, free food? Yeah, I'll work for you. You know, anything to, to help my parents with, fi with the financial aid. But nothing in Florida. So the Lord had something special at Campbellsville. 2002, I meet my wife, Sarah. Sarah's from uh, Scottsville, Kentucky, near Bowling Green. We met there. She started as a music major. Um, um, and so 2002, in 2005, we get married. Uh, 2007, we moved to Louisville. In 2011, we moved to Florida for six years. Um, and then 2017, the Lord brought us back to his country, Kentucky. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we've been a porter since. So all of this, all of this is to, to, to encourage you to whatever walk of life you're in, know that God has you in a special place. Amen. That God has you in the palm of his hand. God has a perfect plan for you, whatever stage of life you are. I see a lot of people with white hair here, even more than I do, even though, you know, I have a few here on my side. Uh, but I also see a bunch of kids, including my son. Um, and I see teenagers around. God, you, you sometimes you go in disobedience. But if you seek him, he's going to find it. He's going to put it in a straight path. path. He has something special for your life. There was this, there's a line in a song that says, God, if you're still breathing, God is not done with you. If you're still breathing, God is not done with you. So I pray that you don't waste any breath and work for him and live for him every day. This little hymn that I'm going to sing right now, it just, um, it's a prayer. Um, that in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. When I am alone, give me Jesus. When I come to die, give me Jesus. So I pray that this is your prayer um, today. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus And you can have all this world but give me Jesus oh when I am alone oh when I am alone oh when I am alone give me Jesus Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, and you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Oh, when I come to die. Oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, and you can. 
can have all this world. And you can have all this world. And you can have all this world. But give me Amen. Thank you, Nuno. I hadn't heard that whole story. And so, uh, Nuno, thanks for sharing that. God is good. Amen? Amen. God is good. It's great to be with you. You know, at my age, it's really good to be anywhere. I mean, I'm at the age where I don't even buy green bananas. I mean, why take the chance? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm at the age where I take naps before I go to bed. It just seems like it works that way. But it is great to be with you, and I want to echo what Nino said. Y'all have been so gracious and kind. I'm glad to have my, my sister with me tonight, and she knows all of you. Because how many of you have worked at American Greetings and knew my sister? Okay, about half the congregation. And I appreciate her uh, coming over, and it's just been, uh, just been great, uh, great to be here and, and be with you. You're, you're a brave bunch, and uh, I appreciate that. I heard about a lady, uh, and her husband went to the dentist, and she said to the dentist, she said, now listen. I want to have a tooth removed. I want it extracted immediately. I don't care how painful it is or anything. Just pull it right now because we're going to, we've got a trip planned. We're going to be leaving town and we've got to do it right away. No Novocaine. Don't want anything like that. Just pull out the tooth so we can go. And the dentist looked at her she said, and he said, I am amazed and, 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 and said, I, I've never met a person like you in all my life. This is going to be really, really painful for you. And, and um, uh, you know, you, you're a courageous woman. And which tooth is it? She turned to her husband and said, Sh show him your tooth. <laughs> and um, <laughs> brave people, brave people. Oh, my. Well, God is good all the time, isn't he? And uh, I appreciate Nuno's story, and I can echo that, how God opened the doors at the right time in my life and still is opening doors. And uh, if you will listen to the Lord and follow the Lord, uh, never underestimate what He can do with you. Now, I'm a James, okay? Jesse James, Frank James, most of my family robbed banks, okay? <laughs> and, but I took a different route. And uh, I was in a revival down in uh, uh, western Kentucky uh, at a church, uh, and I'll think of the name of the town in a minute, and uh, their claim to fame is Jesse James robbed the bank, shot his gun, and there's a bullet hole in the bank where he shot. And so they had noon uh, luncheons there because they were right downtown Russellville, First Baptist Russellville. We were right downtown, so a lot of people, business people came to our lunches. So I said on the first night, I said, well, I'm Mike James, and I want to apologize for what my great-great-grandfather did. <laughs> In robbing your bank and I said if we find the money I will give you half of it back so that's the kind of guy I was but anyway I uh, I want to show you something that uh, you immediately know what it, what it is when I show it to you you know what this is now some of you drink Pepsi and that's okay it's a coca-cola 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 is one product that has really outgrown its humble beginnings. And you probably know the story. In 1886, Dr. John Puberton first introduced Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia, which is still the headquarters of Coca-Cola. And uh, he was a pharmacist, and he mixed up this caramel-colored syrup in a three-legged brass kettle and, uh, in his backyard, and he distributed it by carrying a jug down the street near the pharmacy. Now... More than 100 years later, surveys show that 97% of the world have heard of Coca-Cola. 72% of the world has seen a can of Coca-Cola. And over 51% of the world has tasted Coca-Cola. My first mission trip was in Nigeria. And I was close to the Cameroon border. I mean, out nowhere. One day, we were going through this road and stopped in this little hut. And you know what they had to serve us? Coca-Cola. And it wasn't, it wasn't cold, it was hot, but boy, it tasted really, really good. It's just amazing how Coke is known around the world because the company made a commitment when it began years ago that everyone on the planet 
would have a taste of their soft drink. That was their mission. Now think about this for a minute, church. 97% of the world has heard of this sugar and water concoction, while over 2 billion people in the world have never heard the name of Jesus. And I could quote stats in this own state of how many people don't know Jesus. It's estimated that 17 million people die every year without ever having heard the name Jesus. Now those facts should challenge and inspire us to a new level of commitment in sharing the gospel, the message of Christ. And that's exactly what Christ told the church to do. And the more revived we are personally in our walk with God, the more we're going to be effective in doing that. I want to share with you tonight uh, from the Great Commission. You've heard a thousand sermons on the Great Commission. Uh, it is very, very important. But I want to point out four things we find in the Great Commission. I think that are things that every one of us here should, should be doing. Matthew 28, uh, you know these verses. Listen to it again, if you will. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him... They worshipped him, but some were doubtful. That, that's an interesting verse there. I mean, they see the resurrected Lord and some are doubtful. Uh, verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Father God, I pray that you would teach us some new truth from this passage of Scripture that we know so well. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that every church, if it's truly a New Testament church, should be evangelistic. I don't apologize about that. One of the missions of this church and every New Testament church is to reach other people for Jesus Christ. The moment we start stop reaching new people is the moment we will die. We will die. And many churches across this state are dying because they're not reaching new people. And that is so very, very important. Uh, and I, why is this so important? Well, because when any person places their faith in Christ, that experience brings about a total transformation of the life, just like Nuno talked about. We call it salvation. It happened to me when I was nine and a half years old uh, in a small um, uh, concrete block building in Roland, Kentucky, okay, where uh, a revival was going on and Paul Lawson preached it and uh, I felt something in my heart and I felt like I need to, I remember the first night of the revival, I didn't make a response, but I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit, I couldn't wait to the make a decision and I did and about 18 about well about 15 other teenagers about my age all came to faith in Christ that night and uh, so uh, that was the beginning for for me and uh, the church is not in the business of just being nice or just producing good citizens the church is in the business of believing and sharing that God can change any life through the power of of the gospel of Christ. That's our mission, to share that. Uh, John Wesley, who founded uh, Methodism, uh, would always talk about where he was about, uh, you must be born again, being born again. That's all he would talk about. One day a guy asked me, they said, why do, you, why do you always talk about you must be born again? He said, because you must be born again. <laughs> it's a good thing to talk about. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. We're all in that ministry. The, this gospel, this message of reconciliation can transform the lives of individuals, families, and people all over this county, state, and the entire world as we connect people to Christ. When does a church look like a church? Well, when we do these four things. Number one when we are really serious about worship and praise. Verse 17 says, When they saw him, they worshipped, worshipped him. Uh, did you know that the Great Commission was delivered by Jesus in the context of worship? Isn't that cool? In the context of worship, Jesus gave these, this final 
command for what we are to do. Now, I don't know about you, but the Lord speaks to me in worship. The Lord speaks to me in worship. I hated that period of time we had last year when we couldn't worship. We worshiped online. It's not the same, is it? And I was so glad to get back with people. The Lord speaks to you and to me in our personal quiet time as we study God's Word. But I'm telling you, there's something special when the body of Christ is gathered and we worship in song and in prayers and the reading of the Word, the preaching of the Word. There's something about that that can't be replaced. Amen? Ah, it's wonderful. There's lots of reasons why we, why we should share our faith with other people. Uh, you know, where you spend eternity is a really big deal, don't you think? Uh, our motivation for telling those about Christ really grows out of our worship. You know, when I'm in worship, I, I, I think, I want everybody to experience what I'm experiencing. I wish everybody was here tonight, don't you? To hear and to sing. When we truly focus on Jesus, we worship. Do you have your garments of praise on tonight, as the scripture says? You know, we're here to show the world that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's alive. You know, the deeper your love for Jesus grows, the more committed you will be to obey and to follow and to worship. Worship is not just singing songs or prayer or giving our tithes or offerings or listening to a preacher. You can do all that, really, and not worship. Uh, worship is a heart issue, and it happens in the de deepest place in our soul. Tonight, you, you really decide, every time you come into this place for worship, you decide if you're truly going to worship the Lord or not. To be honest, sometimes we come to church and we just go through the motions. We just go through the motions. And, and, and nothing happens that changes us or challenges us. And that's not the preacher's fault. <laughs> it, it's our fault not to be open uh, to what the Lord wants to do in us. There's a place in Death Valley called Dante's View. Uh, it has a very unusual view for you can look down 282 feet to see a place called Black Water. This is the lowest spot in the Western Hemisphere. And from that same place, the lowest spot in the Western Hemisphere, you can look up to the west and see Mount Whitney, which is 14,495 feet above sea level. It is one of the tallest mountains in the world. So you can stand at one, one spot and, uh, and one place and look down at the lowest place in the world and then turn and look up and see one of the highest places in the world from one position listen church this is what i think worship is worship raises our eyes to the lowest things that we ought not to be looking at to the highest things that we should be looking at amen it moves our focus upward praise and worship tilts our life godward you know i don't know what whatever you're going through i want to tell you worship helps you get through it amen how many times have you been so discouraged and a word from your pastor or Sunday school teacher or another brother or sister in Christ just really lifted you up? Let me tell you, when a church looks like a church, when we really look like God's people, let me tell you, we worship. We worship. Now, if this building this week were to blow away, and God forbid, but a tornado came through, and, uh, and on Sunday morning there, there was not one stick of lumber left in this place you know what you guys would still worship my guess is you'd find a uh, brian would find a city park or he'd find a gymnasium and and before you would still worship you might not have this building but you'd, you'd be worshiping amen worship is powerful how's your worship been lately secondly we see here such divine power verse 18 jesus came up and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on, earth, and on earth. A church looks like a church. The people of God look like the people of God when we have this divine power. True New Testament churches are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, all authority, all power has been given to me. Not a little bit, not some, but all. Is this still true today? Has Jesus lost any of his authority the last couple of thousand years? Some churches act as if they are on the losing side. Listen, I tell you, I've been doing this a long time, about 50 years actually. 
I've never seen such discouragement in the body of Christ as I see today. Never. And uh, we, we got to get over that. Folks, I read the last chapter in the last book. Let me remind you, we win. We win. Uh, radical Muslims don't win. Atheists don't win. Secularism doesn't win. The devil doesn't win. The Lord wins. And when we choose to be on his side, we win too. When you tell someone about Jesus, you have all the authority and power of heaven behind you. You have the strongest power in the world behind you. It's not atomic power by fusion or fission. It's resurrection power, which is the strongest power in the world. You know, earlier in this chapter, chapter 28, verse 2, talks about the stone being rolled, uh, being rolled away. You know, lo lots of folks think, well, I am so, so glad that stone was rolled back so Jesus could get out. Bless his heart. He was trapped in that cold, cold, dark, wet cave. That big, big old, that big old rock in the front of it. Bless his heart. I just feel so sorry for him. No, no. The stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. He done gone. The stone was rolled away to let you and I look in to an empty tomb. I got to go to Israel, as I shared with you two years ago, and uh, I got to look in that tomb. Oh, I'll tell you, it blew me away. I meant to bring a couple of pictures to show you. Their scholars are pretty, pretty sure this uh, was the, the, the place. It may not have been, but it sure looked like it to me. And you can see where the track was, where the stone uh, would roll there. But folks, I looked in too. He's still not there. He's gone. That's the power of the resurrection. You have that power through the Holy Spirit. And you should be excited about that. We have supernatural power from the Holy Spirit. Depend on Him. Acts 1.8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. we got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit in us helps us shine and be what He wants us to be. We are people who have divine power. That power helps us shine and reflect the Father's glory. Luke 8, 16 says, No one lights a lamp and hides it in a jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. The Holy Spirit will empower His church, that's us, so that we shine at school, so that we shine at work and at home. Let me ask you a question. Are you shiny or dim? You know, when you're filled with the Spirit, you shine. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, when, when you accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit came in you. We are indwelt once. That's salvation. There's no second thing on this. You read the Scriptures. But the Bible says we ought to ask to be filled. You know why we ought to ask to be filled with God's Spirit every, every day? Because we leak. We leak. Every day we need a fresh touch, a fresh anointing of God's Spirit so we're strong and we can face whatever God wants us to face. Well, thirdly here, choose to follow God's plan. Jesus said in verses 19 and 20, this is our marching orders. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. We, we know this verse so well. New Testament churches and people are obedient to follow God's plan. You know, long before corporations came up with this whole idea of a, of a mission statement or a vision statement, Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. That's not a new thing. Jesus did that. He gave the church our marching orders. That hadn't changed in 2,000 years. Listen, the Spirit of God and the Word of God is enough to accomplish the mission of God. I'm going to say it one more time. The Spirit of God working in us and the Word of God is enough to accomplish the mission of God. God has called us to be on mission. First, two, first Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. Here's God's plan for the church, to make disciples of all nations. Now you know the word nations in Greek is really people groupings. We're told that there are 22,000 people groups 
to reach with the gospel in our world. And there's a number of people groups that we have yet to reach. There are still people who have not, like I said, two billion people have not heard the name Jesus before. The goal of this church and every New Testament church is not just to build buildings or raise budgets, but to make disciples. Now, we may use buildings and raise budgets, but our mission is to make disciples. And interesting, Jesus didn't say in this passage, I want you to go out and make a bunch of converts. He said, I want you to make disciples. Make disciples. That's a primary verb. And then the three supporting verbs are baptize and, and teach and go. Be a disciple, not just a convert. Listen to me. Converts know God saved them, but they expect to be spoon-fed. They're still on milk. They're still babies in Christ because they're new. And, and we all begin there, right? We all begin there, but surely we don't stay there. Surely we don't stay there. We need to grow up. Disciples have taken on personal responsibility for their own spiritual maturity. And, and they, they learn to feed themselves with prayer and digging in God's word and fasting and reading this book and other great books that God has inspired people to write, listening to other people's testimony and all that. That's what he wants us to do. Let me ask you a question, a question tonight. Are you a, are you a convert or are you a disciple? A church just filled with converts is in trouble. A church filled with the disciples is making a difference in their community. Which are you? If you're a convert, praise God, but are you growing? Being discipled. Somebody said this. I, it's the it's most brilliant quote I've heard, I think, of, in my life. I, I wish I could give credit to whoever said it, but I, I use it. When the New Testament church exhaled disciples they inhaled converts now think about that for a minute when the early church exhaled disciples all throughout the community and the world all of a sudden out there people were one to christ converts were one to christ and they were brought into church they were disciples and then they went out that's what we ought to be doing folks that's exactly what god wants every church to do and the only way we can make disciples is to go uh, churches should be on the go for jesus now there was a day when people came to us as a church as churches there was a day when people would seek out churches and it was like the thing to do that day's been over with a long time people people do not do that we've got to go to them We've got to go and invite them and share Christ. The process of evangelism is not completed until those evangelized become evangelists. In other words, those who are saved, they start sharing. See, you are either an evangelist or you need to be evangelized. <laughs> if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you need to be evangelized. Either your own mission for Christ or you are a mission field yourself. Where are you today? Discipleship growth means really two things. Increasing the number of disciples, that's evangelism, and the depth of disciples, that's spiritual growth. Listen, God never intended His church to be a mile wide and an inch deep. He never intended that. He wanted us to go deep, to dig deep, to grow. Let me give you four marks of a disciple real quickly. You can see how you're doing. And I, I use an M to help you remember these. Number one, disciples are maturing in their faith. They're maturing. They're growing up. Are you? They're in the Word. They're not on cruise controls. They're not lukewarm. Spiritual maturity was part of, of, the, of Christ's go for His disciples. The question we need to ask as a church is, are we developing disciples? And ask yourself, am I growing in Christ? Be excited about your faith. Heard about a lady that was asked, does your husband believe in life after death? She says, oh, no, my husband doesn't believe in life after supper. <laughs> so some people are just like that. They're just, you know, boring and not committed. But we need to be growing and have, be stronger in our faith in Christ. Secondly, the second mark is ministry. Disciples care and serve other people. Jesus trained his disciples to be servants. As we help people grow spiritually, we can only do that by helping them understand the role of serving. A, a non-serving Christian is a contradiction. What's your ministry around here? What's your assignment? What do you do? Maybe you open doors and greet people. 
Maybe you teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you help get this building ready for worship. Maybe you do some things during the week, call on shut-ins. I mean, there are thousands of things you can do for the Lord, and you should have at least, at least one assignment. And the third mark is mission. We've already talked about that. Uh, Jesus' disciples knew their mission was to make disciples, and they did it. And the final mark is multiplication. It's really obvious that the original disciples understood that multiplying disciples was the way Christ planned for it to happen. Uh, to evangelize the world. You know, the Christianity exploded in the first century. It exploded. Not addition, but it was multiplication. You see, you never know the impact. When you share Christ with a person and they become a Christian, you never know the impact. I remember when I was a youth pastor, one of my students, Eddie, uh, shared with a, one of his friends at school, and, and his friend accepted Christ. And uh, he brought, he said, Mike, uh, Bill accepted Christ, but I'm not sure I did it right. Can I bring him into your office so you can check him out? I said, well, okay. So Eddie brings Bill in my office. He was a junior in high school, and I, I asked him questions, and he had accepted Christ. I said, man, that's great. I, I just prayed for him to be strong and blessed him. And then uh, several weeks later, Bill, that Eddie had won, came up to me and said, Mike, I, uh, I won Jim to Christ at school and shared Christ with him. He became a Christian, and I'm not sure I did it right. Did it right. Can I bring him into your office so you can check him out? And I said, sure. So he brings his new friend in, and sure enough, he had accepted Christ. And not too long after that, God moved me to, a, to another ministry in another state. But I thought, where did that ever end? Are you following me? Uh, that still may be going on and on and on and on. That's so exciting to think about, uh, about what can happen with multiplication. Well, the last thing I want to share with you here is experiencing God's presence. That's a mark of of a, a healthy church. He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. New Testament churches experience God's presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, early in this chapter, he says, uh, they were afraid yet filled with joy. Do you ever feel like that? You know, you know, you can be afraid and still be filled with the joy of Christ because in you. you. You can be facing some battles and still have an attitude of victory in your heart. Why? Because we have a guarantee of success because God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. What does that mean? The eternal God is with us every moment of life. The omnipresent God is with us in all the places of life. The all-knowing God is with us in our ignorance. The all-powerful God is with us in our weakness. The invisible God made visible. God in His holiness with us in our sin. I heard Adrian Rogers say once, I thought it was a great word, Bethlehem is God with us. Calvary is God for us. Pentecost is God in us. That's good. That's good. The promise of the Spirit came with mighty power at Pentecost. Concerning the past, the Spirit would remind them of everything that He had said to them. And concerning the future, the Spirit would be the teacher and leader uh, and shower of God's will. Surely I am with you always. The promise of God's abiding presence. Listen, we can do ministry because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. And we can witness and face life's difficulties because God is in us. And then it says, teaching them to observe or obey everything that I've commanded you. And again, behold, I'm with you always, all the days, perpetually, on every occasion, to the very end of the age. You know, I'm glad for this promise where it says, all the days. Have you noticed that there are all kinds of days in life? If you've lived very long, you've experienced all kinds of days. Maybe even today was one of them. Some days are full of joy. You graduate. You get your license. Maybe you get married. Maybe the birth of a child or a grandchild. You, you make some accomplishment. You get a promotion. You get a raise. Some days are just full of, of good things. Some days are full of disappointment. You, you get the results of your test from the doctor. You go through sorrow. You go through a, a defeating time. But the Bible says all the days... He is with us. Church, i got some really good news to share with you tonight. Jesus is with you every day of your life. 
till you take your final breath. And even when you take your final breath, as Nuno sang in that song, Jesus is right there with you. God is with us. History is moving toward a goal when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to return. In the meantime, you and I and our church and every church has this mission. We're to share the message that is the gospel, and we're to share that with everyone we meet. Now it's our move to do that. How are those four areas in your life? Your personal praise and worship? Are you experiencing divine power, or do you feel weak all the time? Are you following God's plan for your life? Are you experiencing God's presence through the Holy Spirit every day? Dr. Ken Hemphill, who was uh, several years ago president of Southwestern Seminary, is one of my mentors. I was on his staff at First Baptist Norfolk uh, for a number of years, and, and uh, we remained friends, and, and we talk uh, usually once or twice a month. And Ken's a brilliant person. He's got two doctorates. He's written about 32 books. I helped him with one book. And, uh, but Ken, uh, growing up, Ken's dad was a preacher in a, uh, uh, just a small church in North Carolina. And Ken was a really good football player. And uh, Ken played football for Wake Forest. And it was supposed to be uh, a turnaround year for Wake Forest. They had not done really well, but it didn't turn out that way, <laughs> Ken shared. Uh, he said they were playing a game. They were down about six touchdowns. And uh, they just were having a terrible season. Ken's dad, again, who was an eternal optimist and a North Carolina pastor, would always, after every game, try to get down the field and catch his son, Ken, before he got on the bus or went into the locker rooms to say something positive and encouraging. Well, this game was so bad, uh, Ken thought, i, I got to get out of here. I don't want to see my dad or anybody. We played so pitifully. And... Uh, and uh, if such a bad game, he was just ready to get off the field. And so Ken's rushing off the field after Wake Forest had lost really bad. But his dad somehow jumped down on the field and ran up to him and caught up with him. And uh, before Ken was getting ready to go in the locker room, his dad said, Ken, son, you looked great. Well, Ken thought, my goodness, what's happened to my dad? He doesn't drink. He's the driest Baptist I've ever met. Has he been sitting in the sun way too long this afternoon watching football? And Ken was kind of worried. And then his dad said again, Ken, you look great in the huddle. <laughs> now, folks, I've thought about that a lot. Sometimes we as a church look great in the huddle. But i got to remind you, the game is out there. This is the huddle that we experience on Sunday mornings and during revival time. But let me tell you, the game is outside these walls. And it's time for the people of God, the church, us, to get out on the field, to be on mission for God. When does a church look like a church? When we worship, when we're filled with God's power, when we share the gospel, when we experience the joy of God's presence. When all God's players are on the field and not in the huddle. Where are you tonight? Are you on the field or are you still in the huddle? Folks, the fact that 97% of the world knows what this is and 2 billion people don't know Jesus, that breaks my heart. That Coca-Cola has done a better job selling a sugar drink that just makes you fat, although I like it, than Jesus, who can give you everlasting eternal life. It's up to us to change that. Amen? Would you bow your head with me? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, right before we have a time of invitation tonight, I don't know all of you here. I've met you just great folks. If you're here tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and you know that if you were to die tonight, you would not make heaven. Because you've never trusted Christ. But you're really concerned about it. The Holy Spirit has touched you. You've heard the gospel of how Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again. If you're here tonight and you've never made that decision, I'd like just to pray for you. I'm not going to come back and bother you. I'd just like to pray for you. You just raise your hand and put it down if you're in that situation. If you're just not maybe sure about your salvation. You've never accepted Christ. I want to pray for you. And I want to pray 
that God helps every one of us tonight to get out of the huddle and to start doing what Jesus wants us to do. Father God, thank you so much for the Great Commission. Thank you, Lord, for what you've asked us to do. Father, we look good in the huddle. We clean up well and we fake each other well. But Lord, this is not where the game is played. God, help us to get on fire and get out of the huddle and serve you. I pray, Lord, for anyone here tonight, Lord, that's not a Christian, that they might step out by faith and ask you to come into their life and forgive their sins, and they will start, Lord, this incredible journey of following you. And I pray, Lord, for anyone here tonight who just might need to come around the altar and pray or come and take Brian's hand and share a prayer request or a need. God, again, I just pray that we're, we are obedient to what you ask us to do tonight. We give this invitation to you. We ask your Holy Spirit to move and touch. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to stand. You come on that first first. If God has spoken to you about a decision you need to make publicly, or if you need to come and pray around the altar for someone or for yourself, you respond as we sing. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. sins runs deep your grace is more and grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need every hour. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need Amen. Another good night of worship tonight. Amen. A couple of announcements just to, to go ahead and get on your radar before we head out. First of all, I want to let you know that we are going to be taking up an offering uh, for these, these two guys who've been leading worship for us uh, this week. We'll be doing that tonight as well as tomorrow night. And so we've got our offering boxes on the back wall back there if you'd like to to put something in there to just to thank these two gentlemen who have come and uh, been leading us this week. I, I know we all appreciate it, and I, I know I certainly appreciate it. I, it's worked quite a work in my own heart, so I'm, I'm thankful for it, if, if nothing else. Uh, also, I want to go ahead and invite you to our uh, final day of the revival on Sunday morning. Uh, of course, we'll, Lord willing, be back here tomorrow night at 7, but Sunday morning, it'll keep rolling at our normal scheduled time, we'll have Sunday school at 9.15.
and then at 1030 we'll come in here for worship. Mike will be back with us one last time. And then after that, we're going to have a chili cook-off. We're going to have soups, sandwiches, desserts, and some hay rides for the kids. And so if you would like uh, more information about what food might need to be brought or, or anything like that, I'm sure that our hospitality team, Pam, would you just give a wave right quick? If you just grab her, she'd be able to tell you any holes that might need to be filled for that meal. If you're looking to bring something, I'm going to be cooking a chili. Uh oh, and now Mike. <laughs> it might be. It might be that. Who who knows what's in a Cajun chili? No one does. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> I, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, de definitely some gator. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to that. On uh, Sunday, if you want to participate in the Chili Cook-Off, it's not too late. There's a sign-up sheet out there. There are plenty of people who are going to try to beat me, and I told them on Sunday, I'll tell you now, I usually tell you I'm going to beat you. I probably won't beat you on this. This is your chance. Whoop up on your pastor when it comes to chili cooking. This is your moment. Uh, I'm looking forward to it regardless. It's going to be a good time, and so be sure to hit that up on your way out the door on the bulletin. No, no, do, do we, need, we probably need a separate sign-up sheet for that, don't we? <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All righty. So if y'all didn't hear that, we need some help putting up some tables and chairs here in just a minute in the fellowship hall. So if you can hop on over there when we wrap up. I know that'll be greatly appreciated. Please, uh, if we all hop in, it'll be done just like that. So let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll get after just that. Father God, thank you for this evening. Lord, I am I'm immensely thankful that you are always with us. That you are, you are never going to abandon us. You're never going to let us go. And Lord, that's so good because we do certainly need you. I need you. And yet no matter what I've said, no matter what I've thought, no matter what I've done, your grace is still enough. You are with me always to the end of the age. Thank you, Lord. I pray this as we head into the weekend. In our last few times of worshiping together, I, I pray that anyone who has some sort of decision or life change that needs to happen through this revival, Lord, don't let them wait until Sunday morning. I pray that they would, they would seek you tonight, that they would seek to resolve whatever you're working in their heart tonight, and that they would go ahead and start walking with you and whatever you are bringing them to, whether it's salvation in you for the first time, or a call into ministry or church membership or whatever it is. Lord, do not let us wait. Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're only guaranteed this moment right now that we're in. Pray, Lord, that we remember that. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you all. Have a good one.